The three authors are Suresh Devakar, myself, and Venki Shankar. Uh, I'm going to present the first part of uh, our talk and then turn it over to Venki a little bit uh, later on. Uh, so this is about our forecasting model that we developed for PepsiCo over a period of oh, three years or thereabouts. And uh, uh, our agenda will be as follows. Okay, I'll present an introduction, uh, talk a little bit about the forecasting needs and challenges, our objectives, the data, the model, uh, overall results and the decision support system, organizational impact and learning, and then a conclusion. The ability to reconcile sales forecasts with performance is critical. It is very important we have a format that allows the field managers to access the model and change inputs as needed during the month. And this is a statement by uh, Albert Carey, the president of PepsiCo Sales, who was, was the boss. And basically, this provides the impetus for the whole project. So, and there's uh, two things that are important here, okay? First of all, uh, being able to forecast accurately. Uh, second of all, uh, being able to have something that's available to the field manager uh, to be able to uh, do what would happen if calculations. Uh, Multi-channel, multi-region forecasts are a key for managerial decision-making and financial planning for the multiple stakeholders of PepsiCo. So this is a very large company with 27 billion in sales, 143,000 employees. It's the second largest supplier in the U.S. to retailers, has multiple divisions, beverage, snacks, sports drinks, juice, breakfast, uh, multiple channels, regions, accounts, and pack sizes. Okay, and the basically the forecasting system has to be able to deal with these things. So what were the needs and challenges of the project? Uh, here's a statement. Prediction in the future is hard, especially though for those who create it. Okay. The specific needs and challenges uh, for PepsiCo were, first of all, they had no systematic way of forecasting. Forecasts were submitted by different managers. Uh, how they arrived at a forecast uh, wasn't clear. Uh, in some cases, uh, they probably weren't very careful at developing the forecasts. Uh, there was a problem with very uneven accuracy of the forecasts. Uh, there was a, a problem of forecasts would mysteriously change without anybody providing explicit rationale. Uh, there was really no accountability if the actuals deviated from the forecast because there was no uh, uh, real evidence about what was causing the deviations. And finally, they're uh, pretty much the same thing. There was insufficient diagnostics. Uh, so uh, whether uh, changes in price were driving problems or uh, lack of promotion or whatever it might be, okay, they uh, uh, wasn't available. Uh, now, Pepsi uh, has, and here we're talking about the beverage division, has multiple channels. And uh, really, the drivers of sales are very different in each one of these channels, and they really require a separate forecast for each channel. Uh, and the project had to deal with each one of these. Okay, so there's the grocery channel, which is uh, a little bit more than a third of the volume. Uh, and this is a category, of course, that's very heavily promoted. Uh, convenience and gas channels, like the 7-Eleven, okay, very different. Okay, a lot of the uh, sales are for on-premise consumption, about half of them. Uh, restaurants, different again, okay, because a uh, very large part of the restaurant sales are fountain sales. Independent business stores, uh, these are small mom and pop grocery stores, uh, tend to be in urban areas, inner city areas, again, very different. Mass merchandisers, Walmart is a major uh, part of this. Business, industry, and education, uh, a major part of this is vending machine sales drug, and so on. So there's, uh, each one of these categories represents a different challenge, and there's a need actually to develop a, a separate model uh, for each one of them. So the, pro uh, the problem of forecasting becomes rather complicated. Uh, there are a number of data challenges that we had to overcome. Uh, there was incomplete data for some channels. Uh, for example, uh, Fountain, independent business stores only had shipment data. Uh, the shipment data was actually available for uh, less than the whole company. It had to be scaled up to the aggregate. Uh, Walmart stopped presenting competitive data, okay, and uh, uh, stopped sending its uh, material to IRI. Okay, and we, again, we had to deal with that. Uh, complete causal or driver variables weren't available in some channels. Uh, for the most part, maybe this wasn't a major problem uh, because uh, 
a lot of the channels for which promotional data is unavailable, uh, promotions are really pretty unimportant. Uh, most of the channels we had weekly data, but for the convenience and gas channels, we had only quad weekly data. Again, we had to deal with that. Uh, there was a region mapping problem. We wanted to develop forecasts by region, uh, but the definition of the regions was different, okay, between the different channels and the different major accounts. And again, that had to be reconciled. So, uh, so those are our needs or what we had to deal with in doing the project. The basic objectives are threefold, okay, and this is kind of important. First of all and foremost, develop accurate forecasts uh, for CSD as carbonated soft drinks and non-CSD, non-carbonated soft drink. Carbonated Pepsi or Mountain Dew or something like that. Non-carbonated would be water, uh, uh, something like that. Uh, Secondly, okay, to offer diagnostics when the actual sales volume differs from the forecast volume. So it's important not only to forecast, but to get some idea of what might explain the difference between uh, the forecast and the actual sales. Okay, and if uh, you, you do this, basically you can uh, get a key or an eye to uh, how you might reconcile problems and uh, uh, change strategies. Uh, and finally, to develop a decision support system that uses field inputs, unifies and integrates the various forecasting systems, and is incapable of doing uh, what-if scenarios on the fly, and is user-friendly. So the managers can actually have access to it, uh, they can use this thing, uh, uh, they can tell what'll happen if I change uh, 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 different uh, causal variables, uh, uh, and so on. Okay, so these are the three objectives, okay, and it's not only forecasting, but uh, to be able to have diagnostics and also a working decision support system. We had to use several different data sources. Uh, for a large part of the project, we have retail data from IRI InfoScan, okay, at the uh, region or uh, RMA level. Uh, this grocery, drug, mass, and, and so on, a large number of categories. Uh, we also uh, had to use wholesale data uh, for two reasons, and in some categories this is all we had, okay, so this would, PBG Horizon is a major Pepsi bottler, and the uh, 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 challenge here, as I said, was that we also had to scale this up to the uh, national level. Uh, a second reason for having the wholesale data is that the uh, forecast of retail sales uh, really don't uh, tell what Pepsi really wants to know, which is uh, what are their shipments going to be. So we had to translate our forecast retail sales developed from IRI data uh, into forecast of wholesale sales, and we had to develop some models for doing that. Uh, use Nielsen scan track data for the convenience and gas, and uh, finally Walmart retail link. So there's a lot of different data sources that we had to deal with. For most of our models, and uh, actually this uh, forecasting system was an ongoing thing, it was done uh, several times, uh, we had weekly data from 1999 to 2003. Uh, we estimated, uh, here's a number, 800 plus viable models, uh, okay, and I guess that number is correct, uh, for CSD and non-carbonated uh, soft drink, and we had to have these forecasts by channel, region, RMA, major pack size, uh, about 15 parameters per model. It turns out that uh, holidays and periods around the holiday are very important in this industry, and it's important to have parameters that control for that. Uh, we estimated relationships between uh, Pepsi sales volume and causal data. Uh, sales volume is measured in equivalent cases. Uh, price feature, display activity, promotional activity, uh, we also had Pepsi and competitive data, though we couldn't include all of variables for these things in each equation. Uh, and finally, seasonality, holiday. The weather turns out to be important for soft drink sales. We included that, uh, and we had uh, some trend variables. Uh, what's the forecasting process? Well, uh, first of all, involved pulling the data. Uh, also, uh, getting inputs from the field. So the idea is, if this model is working properly, that uh, causal promotional variables that come from promotional plans that would come from the field. Okay, we didn't always have that available, as I'll explain in a minute. Uh, run the models, develop a preliminary forecast at the weekly or quad-weekly level. Now, when we got to this level, um, uh, what made things life difficult is that Pepsi required uh, monthly 
quarterly annual forecasts. So we had to take our weekly forecasts and make adjust adjustments for uh, trading days. For example, uh, uh, sales on uh, at the end of the week are much higher than they are at the beginning of the week. So we had to have a model that uh, uh, modeled sales by trading day and made some made an adjustment to that. Uh, in some cases, uh, we had to make adjustments for new products. Uh, so we made all these adjustments, developed a final forecast, and uh, then an important part of this is that uh, scorecards are due tos. Okay, so not only do we have a forecast, but we have some uh, evidence about what might have uh, created deviations between actual and forecast. Uh, in modeling, we tested uh, several different model specifications, linear, semi-log, double log, did very extensive testing to find out which was best. Uh, we used stepwise selection. Uh, one of the problems, uh, of course, with the uh, store level data is that there tends to be a lot of collinearity. Uh, and uh, basically, we eliminated variables with wrong signs and that weren't insignificant uh, so that we got something that uh, we had some confidence in. Uh, we tested models at both the individual region level, uh, uh, pooled models, fixed, used fixed effects, uh, random coefficients across uh, regions, and basically we tested each one of these models to try to figure out which was giving us the best results. Um, we also had, as I said before, we had to have a model that determined the relationship between wholesale shipments and retail sales, and uh, uh, we had to have a model that would calculate quality of day and holiday lifts, and uh, in some cases, where managerial inputs weren't available, we had to predict price feature display for future periods. And we did uh, very in, uh, extensive testing of all these models with holdout samples. Uh, I'll just present one model just to give you a flavor for uh, kind of what typical results look like. Okay, and this one is a random coefficients model for the grocery channel. Uh, let's see on the, uh, and I think there's about uh, possibly three things uh, that are important about this. Uh, first of all, this model included only price and feature display. We also uh, included variables for Coke or tested variables for Coke in our various models. In this case, uh, none of them came out significant, which uh, actually made the forecasting job a lot easier. Um, we would have included them if they did. Okay, a second comment is that you can see highlighted in the yellow uh, temperature which has a significant effect on sales. Okay, as temperature goes up, sales go up. Uh, and then a whole bunch of holiday periods, so Christmas, Easter, the week prior to the holiday, and the week after. And we uh, had to have dummy variables for each one of these things and do extensive testing of their effects, okay, because these are, these are very important. They actually account for a large part of the sales in the category. Okay, the third comment I might make is that uh, we list in the table here the average effects and also our random coefficients models across regions. Uh, so we have a range of effects that we can apply to each region and develop a specific regional forecast that way. Uh, in some cases, the managerial inputs weren't available. Uh, in that case, we had to forecast the independent variables, the ca causal variables, promotion variables, uh, price, uh, feature display, um, uh, whatever, pro okay, and in the example I just presented, okay, whatever promotional variables came in. Uh, well, it turned out that you could get reasonable forecasts of these from uh, looking at the past data. So we estimated a block recursive system, uh, and we were looking for something that was simple that would work, okay, and it turns out that OLS is uh, okay for estimating these systems if the error terms are uncorrelated, and we did an agility test and so on. Uh, so in this case, we have price as a function of uh, exogenous variables and feature and display exogenous variables and price. And finally, the volume is a function of predicted price and feature display. And we get predictions of both of these things. And um, uh, generally, this procedure works satisfactorily where we didn't have uh, forecasted input data. The overall results. Pepsi used mean percentage error, uses mean percentage error as their major criterion, and these were, uh, uh, generally our results were quite good and uh, quite a bit better than anything Pepsi had to compare it with. Uh, mean percentage error for 2003 was as low as 0.1%. Uh, magnitude of this for many challenges and regions, okay, is below 1%. Uh, 
range, uh, similar range for grocery and drug. The major accounts turned out to be much more difficult to forecast. Uh, generally, a lot of errors wa wash out, fortunately, when you do aggregation. Uh, but these were still within about 5% of actual sales. And we, uh, some of the Alberts, A&P, and Safeway, okay, we did quite well. Uh, here's just a summary of results by channels. Uh, let's see, it's probably difficult to see this, but the important lesson or message is that for each one of the channels we're talking about, the forecasts uh, track the sales very well. Here's one for the grocery channel, which is kind of blown up, and you can see that uh, we're able to forecast the turning points uh, very well. Uh, we have an R-square of about 0.9, uh, and the model is doing uh, ac actually uh, quite well. Okay, at this point I'd like to turn it over to Venki, and uh, let's see, I'll sit down and have a rest, and Venki will uh, talk about the uh, uh, rest of the project. Thank you, Brian. Behind the successful implementation of any good forecasting model, we need to have a very user-friendly and uh, easy-to-use decision support system. That's what I'm going to talk about right now. What does the DSS do in this case? First of all, it starts with facilitating input of data on planned price and promotional levels at the field level and at the managerial level too. And what is driving this DSS? The models that Brian talked to you about uh, form the engine that drives this DSS. So this really forms the back end. And what the DSS does is generates automatically benchmark forecasts for the users. And uh, how, does, how is it presented? Well, the managers or the users have the choice of looking at it graphically as well as in tables. And what is particularly important for the successful implementation, we realize, is a good capability that enables the users to drill down and be able to see why the forecast deviates from the actuals and perform what-if analysis uh, of if they change any of the planned variables uh, on, and their effects on sales volume. And who uses the DSS at Pepsi? The use cuts across multiple functions, starting from very senior sale marketing sales, including the president uh, sales. Uh, it includes field salespeople, which spread all over the country, uh, category managers, managers who manage multiple carbonated soft drinks as well as non-CSD categories, brand managers, sales strategists, who are, and going across to finance. Recall that Brian mentioned at the start of the impet impetus for this project is that Pepsi needed accurate forecasting. And believe it or not, this is very important for finance people for uh, coming up with good expectations of Wall Street numbers that will meet the expectations of Wall Street analysts. And so finance is to a very important role to play in the usage of DSS. And uh, it is expected at the end of this year about 100 to 125 uh, key people will be using within Pepsi. The current number of users, though, are only 30, 40, but it's growing uh, tremendously. Here are some screenshots I'm going to present in the next four slides of the DSS. I'm going to start with this first screenshot, which is essentially one that shows an overall picture of the percentage growth for 2003. If you notice, on the right-hand column, there is a forecast grid with the number of causal factors starting with weather and ending with other base activities. And these are the kind of due to variables that the users are interested in looking at. On the top panel, you have a number of graphs, small graphs that range from channel, um, going into region, customer, uh, all the way to due to's. And in the main body of this screenshot is the um, comparison of forecast and actual percentage growth by month uh, for 2003. And as you can see the numbers, the gap between forecast and actual is not only not very small, but the more important feature of this uh, screenshot from the uh, DSS is the fact that it allows the user to be able to go from this to any of the top graphs that you see in the top panel. For example, if a manager looks at this and wants to know what is the breakdown of this deviation in forecast, let me show you the next screenshot that might answer some of this. This gives a breakdown of these gaps by region and four major regions are shown here for simplicity. 
uh, west, central, east, and south. And this gives you a picture of where the forecast deviated um, very much from the actual and what could be the reasons for that. And you can further drill down and see, for example, in the next screenshot, what is the impact of a causal factor such as the weather and what it, role did it play. And here you have a couple of very simple bra graphs that gives you what exactly is the role of this. Incidentally, on the top, in all these screenshots, you see the acronym LIFT, which stands for LRB Interactive Forecasting Tool. That's the name that Pepsi has chosen to give. LRB stands for Liquid Refreshment Beverages. Let me show you a final screenshot here. We saw the drill down possibilities. Uh, there is a screenshot that allows an overall dashboard view or account scorecard view. Uh, if, for example, you were in charge of grocery channels and you wanted to see what is the forecast accuracy by account starting from the first column A and P all the way to HEB in this screenshot. And the first set of major columns is 2003 and it's by quarter and it shows you the deviations per account and then from here on the, the, uh, the vice president can see which are the accounts that need more attention than the others and ha delegate accountability to the particular account managers and then move on. So in summary I've shown you four screenshots that capture the essence of DSS here. It, what, what is the essence of DSS? Uh, forecasting DSS for Pepsi. First is it is something that's easy to use, something that allows diagnostics, drill down futures, and also perform what if analysis. And these are available at all levels for all types of users, which are growing rapidly. Let me now spend a little bit of time talking about the organizational impact and learning. I'm going to talk about it in five aspects, the financial impact, methodological or user marketing science models, transportability of solution, the cultural impact in an organization like Pepsi, and the learning that managers have in a company like Pepsi and managers outside Pepsi, what can they learn, take away. Let me start with financial impact. As executives at Pepsi estimate an ROI of about 1,000 percent, and this is composed of two major parts uh, of annual savings of 11 million. About 10 million from about increase in productivity of 0.05 percent on a sales of 20 billion dollars and about 1 million from redeployment of people. This compared against the cost of remodeling, consulting and building the DSS which is estimated to be about 1 million dollars. And Pepsi believes this is a conservative estimate because the savings do not include the opportunity cost of better forecast, so means for greater volume, and also lower stock outs because you're able to forecast more accurately. And plus, the future impact of, uh, is not factored, and so the return may be actually higher. What about methodological impact, the use of marketing? We believe this is a good um, example of a systematic application of marketing science and econometric models in the spirit of Lydia and Ranga Swami. There are a few uh, important aspects about the modeling choice and the basis of selection. As Brian mentioned, we use both pooled and disaggregate models. We um, tested rigorously all functional forms. We used a lot of estimation methods including hierarchical based, pseudo Bayesian, uh, and simple OLS too. And the basis of selection of the right model in all these cases is first best interpretability and diagnostics and most importantly the fit to, to give the accuracy. Uh, fine tuning or adjustments turn out to be key and the balance between modeling sophistication and practical relevance turns out to be uh, uh, the key takeaway. What about transportability of solutions? It is operational in one beverage division, it's being rolled out to the other divisions right now. The solution is extendable to other packaged goods. Uh, it turns out that the adjustments are key and the DSS interface are key. You've heard Brian and my view of this so far. Let me now play a video from the Vice President of Business Intelligence at Pepsi, Ramin Ivas, who's unable to be here, but uh, who's kindly sent this uh, video presentation. 
Good day. My name is Ramin Ivez, and I'm the VP of Business Intelligence for PepsiCo. Um, I'm very sorry I was not able to make the trip personally to make this presentation, but I'm sure I'm in good hands with Brian and Vinky in providing this material to you. First, I would like to thank their help uh, for not only being a great partner, but helping us to solve for some true business issues that we had. And without their help, um, we would not have been where we are today. Let me give you a little background on the type of work that uh, we have been uh, engaged with uh, with the University of Maryland, and specifically in the area of forecasting. When you think about the complexities of forecasting, when you think about the level of quality and accuracy that organizations are demanding today, and when you think about also from a matrix organization standpoint, the various ways that we look at information, uh, the development of a forecasting was a major task for us. But most importantly, the one thing we have accomplished in this process that we do not see the marketplace offer is not just the forecasting, but most importantly, the explanation of forecast. Understanding the causals and the drivers of the forecast, and as the information come to us, be able to decompose that and understand uh, the variation and be able to explain those variations. This is what this project was all about, is to provide a scientific background and not only forecasting accurate, detailed information for PepsiCo, but also on an ongoing basis develop a tracking system where we decompose the information and explain the variation uh, as they are driven by their causals. So in this process, we had to invest a great deal of talent to understand all the various data sources, to be able to integrate these data sources from media, weather, in-store execution elements, and many other areas such as marketing and sales. And then establish the technology that brings these integrated information together and develops the models required to produce the quality forecast. In this case, um, we have produced something over 25,000 models to be able to provide that quality forecast at the various segments of our business for different geographies. Now, these forecasts, I am pleased to tell you, that have proven themselves as to the quality uh, that they have been able to produce. But also, uh, we have been able to sustain uh, these models from a refresh standpoint and the process standpoint so that they could become part of our uh, uh, everyday work. More importantly, uh, because of the results, now we have been asked to extend this to other aspects of our organization. So, this is truly a demonstration how a, a, a group, a team uh, from uh, Vinky and Brian's team in conjunction with the business can come together and solve for true business issues in a best-in-class way. And for that, I'm thankful and I'm looking forward to a great relationship moving forward. Okay, you heard Ramin talk about this. I'm going to talk a little bit now about the cultural impact and, and form my conclusions, our conclusions. Uh, essentially, this has made a big cultural shift in Pepsi from a top-down approach to field sales input-based approach to forecasting. There is scientific validation. There is rigorous accountability for forecasts in the company. And the buy-in uh, has been achieved through ease of use, uh, easy-to-use web-based DSS. So what are some of the key uh, takeaways uh, for managers to implement such systems? First, very important to get buy-ins from all stakeholders that use the system by only focusing on the strategic issues. Can't focus on everything. Then compare and validate and demonstrate in a pilot version for one channel. We started with multiple channels, but we realized that demonstration of one channel really helps a lot. Then make the DSS easy to understand and use and focus not only on accuracy of forecast, but also on the speed of performance and keep continuously improving. So we conclude that a robust 
multi-channel, multi-region forecasting model for packaged goods uh, being successfully used by a very major firm. And uh, we can also conclude that an easy-to-use web-based DSS uh, with the model as the engine uh, enables widespread use within the company and constant improvement helps a lot. Uh, the successful implementation of such a model like this or sets of models like this requires careful fine-tuning, uh, lots of validations and very good diagnostic abilities which ultimately decide whether the forecasting model is good enough to be used on a permanent basis in a successful manner. With that, I'll stop and invite questions. Well, this, all the things you've uh, done here are uh, the, the things that we should be doing. <laughs> um, what's uh, I always find remarkable is, um, you know, uh, how it got into the organization, and, and I guess it's really still diffusing in the organization, if I follow you correctly. Um, and and how this uh, impl implementation uh, is initially accomplished and, and maintained. So one question is, who within PepsiCo is responsible for this system, that it, that it work and that it deliver numbers uh, day after day? Let's see, to me that's an interesting question, okay. Uh, uh, if it wasn't for Al Carey, this wouldn't work. Okay. Uh, because it started out that Al uh, was dissatisfied with the quality of forecasts, and he was looking for uh, some improvement, and he was behind this thing. So uh, he was a champion. And, and okay. Everybody pretty much had, he's the boss, so everybody pretty much has to get in line, and that helped immensely, and I don't think it would have worked without that. Okay. Uh, okay, it doesn't surprise me that he's a champion. In fact, I would say that's probably absolutely necessary. But somebody day to day has got to vouch for the numbers. It's done at two levels. One is you, VP uh, Business Intelligence, Ramin, has part responsibility to this. And uh, reporting to him is a director and uh, some number of analysts. And they have, at least two of them are dedicated to this task. Uh, and so they're job is evaluated based on the performance and the maintenance of this. So they have an incentive to keep it up and running. Okay. So Suresh, our co-author, uh, was the inside point person. And he was in charge of marketing analytics. And uh, okay, it, it happened that we had a connection with him as well. We knew him well. Okay. And that was, that helped immensely. And he was the person inside that was keeping track of the whole thing. Now, somebody generated a lot of software. Yes. Two, it we took a added while. in two stages. <laughs> Versea was the first one. Raj Ranganathan helped us build the, the, you know, the pilot version and the model. Then Booz Allen Hamilton took over for the mass widespread implementation. And currently, it's being um, um, gone back to Versea for maintenance. So. Excuse me, it's what? Gone back to the original developer for the maintenance part of it. The original developer, and it's the, the, an outside or, organization? Yeah, all okay. are outside people. Okay, okay. And that was the hardest and most time consuming part of the project, I'd say. And, and sort of start to finish, what, how much time has elapsed, or start to where you are now? Well, let's see, uh, we started three plus in the middle years, of I guess. 2001, that's the start, well, we, gen genesis see. of this project, middle, and it's about three years now. Okay. But I think it became operational in 18. To 20 months. It became okay. operational no, no. gradually, Sorry. Okay, which is interesting. Say 24 months. Did you do it by channel, essentially? Or? Uh, we started off with groceries, and uh, we had to do a lot of arguing and presenting and so on to get people to accept it. Uh, and finally, uh, Al, of course, is behind this, which helps immensely. So finally, the resistance wore down, and uh, we got better as it went along. Uh, and it gradually, I think, built itself up to the point where now it's, now it's finally working. Am I looking at the architects of this? I think so. <laughs> we hope so. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's, there's kind of in, a, in a sort of standard organization, um, there's, there's often sort of a two numbers in, in 
in sales. There's, there's a target. Uh, and then there's kind of actual or maybe a third number, you know, what, the, what, the, what some model is saying. Is that, what's the, is, is there anything like that at, at Pepsi? In other words, are people supposed to produce uh, certain target volumes by channel? Or uh, let's see. I think if you look at the genesis of the project, it really started out uh, at the firm financial level. They wanted better financial forecasts uh, because they were uh, uh, business like this. If the financial forecasts are off, uh, they pay, right? They have to answer to Wall Street. And I think that was the real thing that they were initially interested in. And to add to that. Uh, historically, Pepsi had not been good in um, with dealing with Wall Street in the sense they were never delivering what they promised. So they went back and, and attributed it to you know, forecasting problems. And then instead of having a target number, they said, let's forecast better and now come up with some tar uh, you know, percentage growth and tell the street what to expect. And then we'll look better. And they have been doing this for seven quarters consecutively successfully. <laughs> They have been meeting this. Yeah, last and I, time. I think that was the starting point of the procedure, and then it kind of grew. Okay, so down to now we'll do the same thing for individual customers and, and so on, and the salespeople will use it. You see, actually, the, the diagnostic and uh, feedback and uh, having an explanation of causes of weather being a, a good example, which you don't know until afterwards is a very different style of uh, thinking than sort of having your feet held to the fire for a, a specific number. But, uh, but that's a big change in, in an organization. Uh, and Yeah, I think the idea was uh, that's necessary to develop accountability. Uh, so one of the problems that they saw, or Al saw, because uh, he's the boss, right, and he's behind this whole thing, is that nobody was accountable. And now if he can uh, kind of separate out uh, why the forecast was missed. Um, okay, if it's due to something, weather, for example, beyond your control or uh, bad promotional strategy, uh, then you've got a way of uh, developing accountability and a, a start toward that. You, so I think that was the idea. So Al Carey is using this to calculate salespeople's bonuses, right? Definitely, it's one of the incentives, yeah. Okay, well, you were telling us you used, uh, or Pepsi uses, percentage error to evaluate the quality of the forecast, but when you looked across channels, you had some canceling out. So mm -hmm. if there was a little bit of percentage error, maybe an absolute error, there was quite a bit. And I assume that was on the data you were fitting where you knew truth. So there is some error in your model. How do you know whether the salesman missed their forecast or this is just the error that's inherent in your model? Uh, let's say the errors we presented are actually the error for, forecasting errors, okay? So they're not, they're uh, outside the fitting of the model. Um, so is that error or is that some, salesperson yeah, some, who doesn't some make Some of the quarter? error obviously is error, okay? And, uh, <laughs> and others is... And I'm sure Al Carey would call the rest of that error too. But I think the, pers uh, the purpose of having the do-tos, okay, is to, is to get insights into... But more importantly, Lee, this is uh, more preventive than evaluative because the, the what-if analysis, for example, during the course of the month, they are allowed to use it several times. So if they feel that they are behind, they can make changes to the, the promotions and, and so on. So you, he doesn't want a situation in which he has to evaluate at the end of it who missed, who doesn't miss, you know, and then, and then reward or punish people. Yeah, right. Yeah. So this, this is kind of a, a, an incentive for them to use it more often to hit the numbers. I was struck by your point that uh, there's a balance between modeling sophistication and practical relevance. Can you tell us about some of those trade-offs? One place where you gave a little bit on modeling sophistication to get practical relevance and one place where it went the other way? or Just give us a feel for the y'all's learning during the process. It varies by channel, I would say. And uh, for example, in grocery, which is more than one third, uh, we could find that um, it is very important to separate by account. And sometimes some accounts, uh, it is very important for you to, to come up with simple models 
and and prove it to the retailer, for example, the account that you know this is this is the target that you, you want you to to work on and and work with, uh, and that may be much more important than just building a very sophisticated model just for forecast accuracy. Um, for example, in drug, which is only two percent, um, even though you know it is only two percent, we need to have very accurate sales because. Sometimes we need to have the correct model for that. So maybe some sophisticated model that's giving you correct forecasts is very important because even that small percentage can make a difference to your final forecast. So there are some trade-offs like this which, which go th run throughout our entire set of channels and regions. Yeah, well, also I think one of the things, uh, there's such a large number of models here that it's important that everything has to be automated. And uh, you can't develop a perfect model for, uh, for each situation, right? There, uh, large part of the thing has to be automated, so that's one of the trade-offs. So uh, I think what you do is uh, do pilot studies and uh, take parts of your data and do very extensive testing. Uh, but then, you, at the end of the day, you have to automate the whole process, and you can't have every model perfect, or you just wouldn't have time. So I think that's one of the major trade-offs.